Hey, everybody. <laughs> so as John just said, my name is Esther. I know some of you, um, my daughter and friends, uh, but I really don't know a lot of you. Uh, as John said, we've only been coming to Netcast. We've been partners here for two years, um, which I think is a long time in Netcast land, but it's maybe not um, you know, a long time in other places. Uh, but I, I have worked in other churches and and so when you work in the church community on the North Shore of Boston, which is sort of a, you know, the Christian community is kind of small, north of Boston, you do hear about other churches. So I've known about Netcast. Um, <clears throat> however, the actual first time, the first time I heard about Netcast, actually, um, was not through Churchland. I was uh, at the Plosker's house. You guys know Kelly and Ryan Plosker. They've been, um, thank you, they've been uh, attenders of Netcast for a really long time, and they've been friends of ours for a really long time. So I want to say this was about 10 years ago. And... Uh, Kelly loves to have a Halloween party, which I know, like, not everybody does Halloween. Totally cool. But what Kelly does is she has a party at her house, and you can come, and you can trick-or-treat, don't trick-or-treat, you know, do what you want. But it's just like a space where everybody shows up, and most everybody shows up in costume. So, again, this was uh, about 10 years ago, so our kids were little, and they were definitely in costume. I was in costume. I was wearing my senior prom dress. Uh, and <clears throat> thank you. Um, my husband, who was at the first uh, two services, he was dressed... Um, as a suburban dad with a button-down shirt. It was like a really catchy costume. Uh, but there's lots of people in costumes. And the thing about costume parties is when you don't, you know, when you don't know everybody and then there's a costume, a layer of costumes, you, you really aren't sure what's going on. So you might know somebody, but you're not sure. Did I meet them? Is that a costume? So I walked into the kitchen and I had my bag of candy to, you know, donate to the, to the, the fund of candy for Halloween and put it on Kelly's counter. And over here was a gang of, like, teenagers that I didn't recognize. And I just wasn't sure who they all were. And, you know, so I said, hey, Cal, thanks for having us to the party. And, and there, was one, there was one guy, like, you know, I'm a mom, so what do I know? But uh, I thought the costume was maybe, like, wannabe white boy rapper. I, I don't know. Um, and so I was like, hey, Cal, thank, is this, like, so are these, like, some of Jordan's friends that I haven't met yet? Like, I don't know. Who's the, who's the wannabe white boy rapper? And Kelly said, <clears throat> oh, Esther. And she took my arm and she walked me over. She said, let me introduce you to our new pastor, Matt Tuning. <laughs> Pastor of Netcast. And by the way, it's not a costume. That's how I first heard about Netcast. And Matt looked up from his phone. He's like, sup? And I was like, weirdos. And here I am, one of the weirdos on stage, lo, these many years later. So today I'm really excited that I get to preach to you from Daniel 6, because Daniel 6 is the end of what we learn about Daniel's life, about his story. There are some more chapters, 7 through 12, um, and those are going to be Daniel getting visions from God, words of prophecy from God, but they're not going to be telling his actual story. And so what we've been looking at for the first five uh, uh, sermons here, and now I'm the sixth sermon, is his actual recorded history. He has highlighted for us what he wants us to know about his life. And so I'm excited that I get to sort of bookend what Matt started in chapter one. We get to see, like, how did it end? How did his life go? Um, and we've been talking in this sermon series for the past five weeks really about how the book of Daniel is about two kingdoms, right? It's about the kingdom of God, and it's about the kingdom of the world. Or sometimes Matt has been calling that the spirit of Babylon, right? So there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the world, and the other thing we've been talking about is that in many very real ways, our lives are a lot like Daniel's, which is sort of weird to say, because Daniel lived 2,600 years ago in the ancient Near East, a really long time ago, really different place. We live in 2024. We're going to church in a mall. We have these crazy, like, high power lights. That corner back there has air conditioning, like so much air conditioning. I'm, if I could bring blankets to hand out to you back there, I would. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have high power lights in the ancient Near East. But our lives are a lot like Daniel's emotionally and spiritually. And we've been talking a lot about that in this sermon series. Now, Daniel 6 is in the Old Testament, but it falls near the end of the Old Testament, and it falls sort of in the middle of the Bible. And the Bible, and Moms from Moms group have heard me say this 100 times, the Bible is one story, right? The Bible is 66 books, but it is one story. There is one main character and it is not you. You're not the main character. And like every good story, once upon a time, the Bible starts in the beginning. And to really understand the story of Daniel, we have to go back to the beginning of the story, the story of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created humanity, Adam and Eve, in his image. And we hear that, and we like say, yeah, 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 God created in our image, in his image. 
What does that mean? It's not like we go around talking that way in Starbucks, like I'm created in God's image. We don't talk that way. So <clears throat> to help you think about this, I was thinking about in our house, we have a, a workout space in our basement, and we have a decal on the wall. It's a fat head. You know, you can order those, those fat head sports. I'm not really a sportsy person, but here's a sports analogy. Um, and this may end the sermon. So just so you know, I think I've been up here three minutes, and this, you may boo me off, and oh, you're especially going to boo me off. Um, the fat head is of Joel Embiid the center of the Sixers, I know, sorry. So Les and I, like, we, we're here, we've been here 21 years, but our heart and soul is in Philadelphia, and so what we can retain is, is Philly sports. So we have Joel Embiid. He is 7'2", okay? And this is a life-size decal on our wall. We can learn a lot about Joel Embiid's image, the sticker, by looking at it, right? Like, I can walk up there and put my, my foot next to his. It's huge, right? He's this big guy, he can palm a basketball, can learn a lot about him. Is Joel Embiid in my basement? No. His image is in my basement. And we can learn a lot about who he is from looking at the image. Just like when God created us in his image in Genesis 1, we're his image bearers, which means we should be able to know a lot about the characters of God by interacting with people in his image, which is you. We should learn about love, grace, humility, compassion, right? We should learn all these things because we're created in God's image. But as every story goes, there's a plot twist, right? And what happens in Genesis is the serpent, the snake, the spirit of Babylon, enters into the garden and comes up to Eve and Adam, the Bible says he was standing right there, and says, did God really say that? And Eve explains, well, yeah, no, God said we can't eat the fruit in the garden from this one tree. If we eat the fruit from this one tree, we'll die. And the serpent says, he won't die. And they heard the lie, and they believed the lie, and they thought, well, maybe there's something to this. Maybe we can do better than God. Maybe we need that knowledge ourselves. And they ate the fruit, and death entered. Their image was broken. It's like if I went to my basement and I ripped the sticker in half. You still can tell it's a basketball player, right? But it's broken now. You don't have all the information you need. And in a very real sense, what happened in the garden was when their image was broken and death entered, everything broke. We feel that. We feel that in our hearts and in our lives. Everything broke, and they could no longer be in perfect relationship with God. They could no longer be in this garden with him in a perfect relationship the way that they, we, are designed to be. And God had to send them out into exile. They were no longer where they were supposed to be. We are no longer where we are supposed to be. They were sent out into the world. Identity, still image bearers of God. Job, he said, cultivate the world. It's broken now, but cultivate it. But God also sent them out with a promise. Genesis 3.15 says, someday, Adam and Eve, your descendant is going to get into it with that serpent again. And that serpent is going to bruise your descendant's heel. But your descendant is going to crush his head. Okay. So in Daniel 6, we find Daniel living this life of very real exile from Jerusalem in Babylon, and he is created in God's image. He has a job to do, and he knows the promised Messiah is someday going to come. Daniel also has a letter. There was a guy in Jerusalem who didn't go into exile, who didn't come to Babylon, and he wrote a letter from God to the exiles. His name was Jeremiah. You may have heard of him. He's a prophet. He wrote the longest book in the Bible. It's so long. And he wrote to them, to the exiles. And we know that Daniel read this letter. In chapter 9, it talks about Daniel reading the prophet Jeremiah. We know Daniel read this letter. And let me just read you a few words from this letter from Jeremiah. Remember, he's speaking on behalf of God. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Now listen, I know there's some graduates here. Some people just graduated from high school like yesterday, some college last month, and you may have gotten this, this verse, for I know the plans I have for you like on a mug or a tote bag, or, you know, you might have had a verse book that people can sign. And people love to write this to graduates for the know the plans I have for you. It's a great, it's a great verse for you, graduates, but it's a great verse for all of you. And it's a greater verse when you know it in context. It is to exiles. 
it was written to the exiles in Babylon. It was a very specific time and place. And now we get to have that letter and we get to have that advice for our lives as well. Seek the welfare of the city you are in. That is what Daniel had been faithfully doing for 80 years, seeking the welfare of Babylon. We are to seek the welfare of Danvers, of Saugus, of Lynn, of Boxford, of Middleton, of Beverly. We're to seek the welfare of the city that we are in. So that brings us to chapter six. Here's Daniel. He's been living his life in exile for all of these years. And we're going to look at chapter six, what I'm calling Daniel's super regular day in exile when he got thrown into a lion's den. Take a sip of water. Whoop, except I'm not. Just a little sip. Hang on. And now I will avoid this puddle. Um, there's three things that we're going to look at <clears throat> in chapter six. And I'm going to take them chunk by chunk. Um, and I'm going to read the verses, but I'm going to consolidate because it's a lot of text. So first up, Daniel 6, verse 1. It pleased Darius. Now, Darius is Daniel's third king. Okay, remember he had Nebuchadnezzar, and then he had Belteshazzar, and now he's got Darius. He's going to have Cyrus before he's, before he's done. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps. So I was like, how do I make this real to you guys? Like, what's a satrap? So I went into Google, and I actually Googled, um, what's a satrap? And Google came back helpfully and said, a satrap is like a viceroy. And I was like, that's actually not helpful at all. <laughs> what's a viceroy? Was it Star Wars? I don't know what a viceroy is. So let's pretend that a viceroy is like a governor, okay? So like Babylon, they put the land into pieces, and they, 120 of them are over each piece. So 120 satraps to be throughout the kingdom, and over them, three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps would give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. Verse 3, then Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, the satraps, this just made them so crazy. This made them so angry because they had been here before. Every time Daniel interacts with a king, Nebuchadnezzar, Belteshazzar, he's successful. Remember, he's seeking the welfare of the city that he's in, and they promote him to places of prominence. And the satraps have had it. They're so over Daniel getting all the special attention, always getting promoted, always having authority. And so they plot to frame him. But verse 5, they say, we can't find any ground for a complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So first up, point number one, the kingdom of the world, the spirit of Babylon, the kingdom of the world will try to turn you from God through culture. Now Daniel's life had been in exile this entire time, and this was nothing new. They had been trying to come after him through culture since the very beginning. They tried to change his name. They tried to change his diet. They tried to change his ability to have a family and a succession. They went after his friends. They threw them in the furnace. They set up pagan gods. There's all these ways every single time, every king, every empire had been trying to take Daniel and change him through culture. And at every juncture, Daniel was able to resist. How is Daniel able to do that? Well, verse 3, thanks, Greg. Verse 3 says, he was distinguished above all others because he had an excellent spirit. That word spirit, uh, Daniel is written in both Aramaic and Hebrew, and thankfully, it's basically the same word in both languages. The word spirit is ruah. It's the same word spirit that we see in Genesis 1, back at the beginning of the story. The spirit of the Lord hovered over the earth. The spirit is what's allowing Daniel to be distinguished, this excellent spirit. Now listen, this is the Old Testament, okay? So we don't see a a lot of of, of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. How much more after Jesus comes, fully God and fully human, and lives a life that we can't live, and dies, and resurrects and overcomes death, and then says, I'm gonna send the spirit, how much more should we be distinguished because of an excellent spirit? Jesus says to his followers in John 14, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him because he dwells in you and will be in you. Listen, culture is everywhere because culture is everywhere. That is what culture is. Culture is right here. If I get boring, I know you're checking your phones, you're on Facebook. That's culture. You're going to walk out of here. You're going to see them all. That's culture. The movie posters, that's culture. Where you bought your clothes from, that's culture. And it is constantly, constantly whispering to you, did God really say that? You won't die. 
you're going to hear that lie whispered from TikTok, from Netflix, from Instagram reels when you're doom scrolling, from TV, from jobs. It's going to tell you who to be, what to dress, what to eat, where to shop. When you hear that lie whispered from all these places, it's going to start to make you question like Adam and Eve, like, yeah, well, all right. Yeah, maybe God didn't really say that. Maybe I actually do know better. I mean, maybe like I actually could make a better decision than God in this particular situation. And you're going to work harder and you're going to try and get more money and you're going to try and get more degrees and you're going to hit the gym more and you're going to get the girl and you're going to get the guy and you get the house and 2.5 kids and then what? Oh, well, sorry, no, culture doesn't answer the question. It just whispers the lie. And all you have to do is listen to the lie and believe the lie and culture turns you from God. It is with the spirit of God that we can resist the culture. It is only through the spirit that we are able to say no and say God did say that. But listen to me. When Daniel didn't fall into the cultural trap, the kingdom of the world got mad. And when the kingdom of the world can't change you culturally, point number two, it's going to come after you with chaos. I mean, like I live in constant state of chaos, so this is so true for me. Um, verses 6 through 15. This is going to be Esther's condensed version. You cannot buy this Bible on Amazon. Verse 6. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said, Oh, King Darius, live forever, all that. We think that whoever prays to any god or man for 30 days, except to you, should be thrown into the lion's den. I mean, just so you know, that is actually as random and extreme as it sounds. There's no reason to make that rule. There was no reason to make that law. They went on and on about how the law was going to be irrevocable, and once you sign it, you can't change it. Blah, blah, blah. All these things happen, and the king signs it. We're going to come back to that in a second. Why did the king sign it? But he did. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had a window in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had previously done. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel praying and knew their plan had worked. They ran tattletailing to the king and told him, oh, you know, Daniel's praying. And then the king, he was really upset about this because he really liked Daniel, and he tried to find a loophole in this crazy law that he signed, but he couldn't. And verse 15, the men came by agreement, and they said, nope, you signed it, and it can't be changed. When the kingdom of the world can't change you culturally, it will come after you through chaos. You might be saying, well, where's the chaos in that story? So glad you asked. <clears throat> Verses 6, 11, and 15, by agreement, three times, the men came by agreement. That doesn't sound chaotic, right? By agreement, it sounds like Robert's Rules of Order, like very orderly. Uh, that's a Presbyterian joke. Um, <laughs> but do I have any King James people here? King James? If you have a King James Bible, your word, instead of by agreement, says thronging. Listen to me, guys. I am not saying the word thong. Don't go out and be like, Esther was talking about thongs in church. That is not what I'm doing. It's thronging, T-H-R-O-N-G, and you don't know this word. We don't use this word. It's not really a word that we ever talk about. I am a writer. I've been writing a column. I've written three books. I've written for decades. I've never used the word thronging. So that's why the ESV said by agreement, but that translation doesn't really get to the heart of this because what's really happening, thronging, communicates chaos. It communicates tumult. It communicates, well, it's, it's the same word that in Psalm 2, verse 1, when it says, why do the nations rage? It's that word, rage. Why do the nations rage? It's chaos. The satraps were coming to Darius full of anger and fear and madness. You can imagine just a crowd of people with pitchforks and their arms are going like this. Wild Darius, we don't want you to suffer any loss. You might lose money. You might lose face. You might lose authority. You better quick sign this document that can never be revoked. And Darius buys into it and signs the document. Why does he do that? Well, because... <clears throat> when emotions get high, and I don't know if this is true for you guys, but for me at least, when emotions get high, you can act in ways that are not based in reality, not grounded in the truth. So just a little story here to illustrate the point. Many years ago when the girls were little, my little girl sitting in the front row was in first grade. We went to California. Les had a client there, and we pulled them out of school because that's what you can do when kids are little. Just FYI, you should do that. And we took them for a, sort of like a, a week-long break, and uh, we stayed in like a little, you know, efficiency hotel right in San Diego, Southern California. It was so awesome. We were at the beach on day two, and my phone started blowing up. Ding, 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 ding. Look down on the beach. My daughter has lice. My daughter has lice. 
my daughter has lice. My son, I'm going to shave his head. The first grade class had lice. It was going down in flames. And I was like, suckers, because I'm in California and you're in Boston and we are literally a country apart from your little lice problem. Came back to the pool. Riley was flipping around doing somersaults. And as her head came up, I literally said, oh, sweetie, you have so much sand in your hair from the beach. Now, you have to know me. You really have to know me to know that I have a lot of phobias. And lice is one of them. And you have never seen three people teleport, I mean teleport, out of the pool. There was no stopping in the room to change out of your bathing suits. Teleport from the pool to CVS. Stay in the car, girls. I ran in there like a crazy wild woman. And the clerk was like, oh my goodness, can I help you? Because I'm for sure she thought like somebody had chopped an arm off, you know? And I was like, yes, you can help us. We have lice. She was like, oh my, okay. That's aisle three. And the people parted like the Red Sea and I walked in and then... I actually did this motion. I don't know if you've ever been so hysterical that you do this with a shelf, like all the products, like all of it, just whatever it is, I'm taking it. Back to the hotel, teleported back, still in our bathing suits. There's no, like, we're not stopping for anything. And I, um, I bought, like, the scorched earth, like, don't come at me with your peppermint fairy oil, whatever. No, I wanted, like, all the chemicals. And I treated all of us. I treated Riley and Abby, who did not seem to have lice, and myself, who also did not seem to have lice. And I was reading the instructions, and I was freaking out, and it said, you have to sterilize the comb. And I'm like, okay, i got to sterilize the comb. So I turned on the pot full of water on our little stove, the little efficiency stove, and I set it to boil to sterilize the comb. And I came back over to the girls. I was like, don't move, don't breathe, nobody touch anything. And all of a sudden, boom. And I looked over. Turns out, I had not turned on the burner underneath the pot of water. I had turned on the burner underneath the hospitality basket with the coffee and the tea and the Wi-Fi password, and it had went up in flames. That was a call. That was a call to the front desk. In the end, I found two lice in Riley's hair. (laughs) No nits, nothing on myself, nothing on Abby. But I did manage to almost burn down a hotel, and I certainly terrorized most of Southern California. (laughs) Because, and maybe again, this is just me, but when we are upset, we let chaos take over, and we act in ways, and we do things that don't make sense. We let our emotions dictate what truth is, not reality. And that's what Darius did. He let the satraps get to him. He bought into the lie. He went into his fear, his, his suffering a loss of money or power and authority. But what did Daniel do? How did Daniel react to the chaos? He's the one getting thrown into the lion's den. Verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber, open towards Jerusalem, and he got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before God as he had previously done. Listen, there's no law in Leviticus that says, like, you have to pray three times with an open window facing Jerusalem. That's, Daniel is doing that because it is his spiritual discipline, because it was what he had previously done. It is what he had been doing for 80 years. When the chaos comes, he had the spiritual discipline to fall back on because it is what he had previously done. You can't fall back on a spiritual discipline if you're not doing it now. It won't be something you've previously done. You have to do it now so that in the future, it's something you have previously done. Every single day, are you in the Word? Are you reading the Bible? Are you reopening up no matter what your schedule is that day and just reading something somewhere in the Bible so that when chaos comes, it's what you've previously done. It's just what you do. It's your spiritual discipline. Are you praying to God? Do you talk to God? Do you tell Him your fears? the things that make you scared and upset and sad so that when the chaos comes, it's what you've previously done. You talk to God. That's just what you do. We just had a sermon series on fasting. I tried it. Made me grumpy. But it's a discipline. Maybe for you, fasting is something you do so that when the chaos comes, I mean, the chaos is here. Like, it's not just that it's coming. You all know this. You go out there, it's chaos. So that it's what you've previously done. You're sitting here right now in church. You're somebody who attends church this Sunday. Do you come to church every Sunday? I mean, there's exceptions. I get that. But is coming to church something you have previously done so that when the chaos comes, you're like, yeah, okay, but actually I got to go to church tomorrow? I know sometimes the sermons are boring. I know sometimes the lyrics don't make sense. You sloppy wet kiss. I don't know what that song is. (laughs) But you come not because of that. You come because God says be in a community of believers to be in fellowship with one another. So when the chaos comes, it's just what you do. It's what you've previously done. 
But listen, it's going to get gnarly now. Because if the kingdom of the world can't switch you through culture or through chaos, it's just going to simply try to crush you. The kingdom of the world will try to crush you. Verses 16 through 23, again, Esther's condensed version. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. Which, just remember, he's in his 80s, okay? So, like, it's not like you open up a door and you walk gently into the lion's den. He gets thrown. So, first, the first obstacle for Daniel was he's 80 being thrown into a pit. And the king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continuously, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then, verse 18, the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. And no diversions were brought to him, and I don't think they mean Netflix, and sleep fled from him. But then, we know this story. We know how this goes. In the morning, the king went to the lion's den and said, Daniel, has your God whom you served continually been able to deliver you from the lions? And Daniel says, yes. An angel came and closed their mouths, and I am alive. And Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. So here's the question. The kingdom of the world tried to crush Daniel. When? When did they try to crush Daniel? Was it just here at the lion's den that one day in Daniel's life when he prayed, as he previously had done? Was that the first time they tried to crush Daniel? No. Chapter 6 is so great because it's like a small version of the entire story of Daniel's life. Because Daniel, since the day he arrived in Babylon, had been living in the lion's den. Daniel was in the lion's den. That's what exile is. You're living in the lion's den. That is true for us as well. We are in the lion's den. There are threats and dangers at every turn. It is a dark, crushing place. He had been living in the lion's den under king after king, pagan gods, ruthless, chaotic, murdering satraps and viceroys for 70 or 80 years, day after day, year after year, different kings, different empires, same old attempts to try and crush Daniel, to turn him from the God he served in the kingdom of God. You just, you kind of wonder, like, when I think about this story, I just think, was Daniel kind of like, I mean, come on, guys, really? Like, I'm 80, I'm 80-something. Is this the best you got? Like, fine, put me in the lion's den. Like, maybe I'll get a decent night's sleep for a change, you know? And you just wonder, like, was he just like, I, I, I don't know, maybe God will call me home, but maybe I'll just get a nap with a cat. It's kind of like, so this is, this is like, you don't raise your hand and nobody, like, avert your eyes. Don't look me in the eyes. So I don't want to, like, call anybody out here. But moms, <clears throat> nobody look. Sometimes we pray to God, dear Jesus, can I just get low-level pneumonia? I'm just, I'm going to need low-level pneumonia, and it's going to be bad enough that I have to go to the hospital probably for two nights. Um, and it's going to need to be a private room. I mean, it's that dangerous, of course. And I'm going to need some hydration, saline fluid, you know, maybe a drink of your choice, whatever. No visitors, obviously. Not, not bad enough that I have to be like, you know, I'm big at medication or something like that, but just like two nights, low-level pneumonia. Don't, we, that can be our little secret. But I know you pray that. <laughs> because life is crazy, and dinner time is impossible, and kids don't sleep. And I don't know, sometimes you just want a night in hospital. <laughs> and I think in the same way, Daniel might have been like, I mean, God's going God's to either save me or call me home. But this life in exile is life in the lion's den. It is hard. It is a hard life because it's broken. We broke the design back here. We broke the image of God. We broke the world. Everything broke in that moment. And you are living in exile in a broken world. Listen, tomorrow's Monday. You got to go to work, right? Everybody goes to work. Some of you tomorrow are going to maybe get promoted. So awesome. Good job for you. Some of you might get fired and laid off tomorrow. Some of you might have been signed up to run the marathon next April in Boston, which is so awesome, like incredible. <clears throat> Some of you might get a cancer diagnosis this year. Some of you may have really healthy, thriving marriages, but I know that some of you are sitting here with a court date. Some of you have kids who are getting great grades, they're doing all the right things, making good choices. Some of you have kids who are cheating, and they're going to get expelled this week. This world in exile, it's not easy. It's broken. We're broken. But Jesus said, 
I've said these things to you in chapter 16, John 16, that in me you may have peace. Please note that he does not say in your job you may have peace. In your family dynamics you may have peace. In your gym membership you may have peace. In your new car or your big degree you may have No, Jesus says in me you have peace because, next verse, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. We should, just, we should know when we follow Jesus, life is not going to be perfect. But in Jesus, we find true peace, true peace. So what happened? Well, we know Daniel was saved from the lion's den. It says, no harm was found on him because he trusted in God. And hear me, this does not mean that if you trust in God, bad things won't happen. We just talked about that. We just talked about that. That's not what that means. It means when bad things do happen, and they will, you know who to trust, where to get your peace. Who is your true king? You see, there's one more verse in chapter 6 that we're going to talk about that sets it right here in the middle of the whole story of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, there's one more verse that puts Daniel into context of the big story. It's a story about Daniel's life, and it's a story about our life serving the main character of the story. Verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. There would be another stone. Another stone sealed across a place of death. And Matthew 22 says they sealed that with a ring too so that nothing could change. Two morning walks. Darius comes to the tomb. Daniel, are you alive? Yes, he's alive. Daniel comes out. And you know that they threw those sat traps and viceroys into the lion's den. And before they even hit the ground, they were dead. Because the lions were hungry. God just saved Daniel that time. Another morning walk. The women walking in the early morning in the dark with spices coming up to the tomb where the dead body of Jesus was supposed to lie, but that stone had moved because behind that stone, every single thing changed for all time. And when the women got to that tomb, there were two people there. It wasn't Jesus, it was two angels, and they said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Darius knew this at the end of chapter 6 in Daniel. He said, Daniel's God is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall never come to an end. That's right. That's totally right. The kingdom of God will not end. It will not be destroyed. That is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. That is the story of Daniel's life. It points us to Jesus because we are in exile. And when they ate the fruit and we were complicit, death entered the world. Death is in everything that we do. Death is in our sports. It's in our money. It's in our jobs. It's in our family. It's in our weather, especially in Boston. It's in our very best ideas and intentions. Death touches everything. It's in my heart. It's in your heart, except remember, God sent them out of the garden with a promise. And Jesus is that promise. Jesus is the promise He is the way back and the way forward to being in a perfect relationship with God again. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. It's a life that seeks the welfare of the city that you're in, Danvers. But knowing that your citizenship is in the land of the living. And you may be sitting here, you guys, today. I know some of you are dreading walking out of those doors, dreading what you have to face, the culture and the chaos, it all is going to seek to crush you. You may be sitting here today feeling alone, hopeless, and lost. Your life may be so different than what you thought it was going to be, but have you met Jesus? Because he changes everything behind that stone. He changes everything. He invites you to follow him. He invites you to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. He calls you to be in the land of the living. Amen. We're going to take communion here in a second. And so listen, if you're in here and you know that your citizenship is in the land of the living, great. This is for you. It celebrates what happens behind this stone. It celebrates that Jesus overcame death, but it also points us 
It points us to the final great feast that we are all longing for, where someday we will be returned to our perfect design in relationship with God. It points us towards that. If this is new and you're sitting there like, whoa, I, I think I, that's what, I want to be in that country. I want to have that citizenship. Yeah, yes, that's all you have to do. You have to tell Jesus that you want to be a citizen of the kingdom of God and the land of the living. Right now, in your heart, you can say that and then come find somebody afterwards and tell us and we'll set you on your way and then you come up here too. And listen, if this isn't for you and you're not there yet and you're just here because like you walked through the mall and saw like, I don't know, like, I don't know, free air conditioning, great. There's never been like a better church that's like less awkward for just staying in your place. Like Netcrest is the easiest place for that. So then it's not for you. But if you can say yes, when the lie comes, did God really say that? Yeah, he did. Yes, he did. I am a child of God. I'm an image bearer. Jesus promises me peace in him, and I will live my life faithfully serving until my king calls me home to the country where my true citizenship lies. Amen.